Oh, hello everyone. And welcome to the third night of the Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator this evening as we hop across the pond to enjoy the scenic and historic British Isles with Rick and a couple very special guests. And now without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our host for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Gabe, thank you, and thank you all for joining us on another night where we're celebrating Europe, and specifically, we're celebrating our Rick Steves bus tour program. And today, the focus is on Britain and Ireland, and we got a lot of ground to cover. We'll be together for about 75 minutes. The first half is going to be England and Scotland, and the last half is going to be Ireland. And as Gabe mentioned, we have two wonderful guides that are waking up in the middle of their night to join us live from England and from Ireland. So we're fellow, we're celebrating travel right now, and I'm going to jump right into the slideshow so we can get in there and be inspired to adventure into the British Isles or Ireland. And whether you're going on your own or whether you're going to take a tour, we've got a lot of important information to share with you. Gabe mentioned we're halfway through our festival. It is Britain and Ireland tonight, as you can see here. Tomorrow is Spain and Portugal, then France, then Germany, then Central Europe. And next Monday, we're all coming over to my place for a virtual party. We're coming over virtually, and we're going to have a lot of fun. And that is for sure. We hope you can make that. Now, uh, when we think about all of these destinations today, we're covering a lot of tours. There you can see them. Uh, in this region, we've got a one-week tour of London. We've got the best of England in two weeks. We got the best of South England, which complements the rest of England. Uh, we got two tours of Scotland. One is for people who have 13 days for their vacation, and the other is for the quicker look eight days. And we've got two versions of our Ireland tour. One is two weeks, and one is one week. We have 150 amazing guides at Rick Steves Europe. I am so proud and thankful for these people that are our teammates. They are our colleagues. They are our travel buddies. And together, we take 30,000 Americans around Europe every year on about 1,200 different tours. And uh, more about half of our travelers are return customers, and they have high expectations. And these guides know how to meet and exceed those travel expectations. This is our spaghetti map, and we're going to be focusing right in there on the northwest corner of all of that travel fun, England, Scotland, and Ireland. The England itinerary, if you have two weeks, starts in Bath. It's a great place to start. You fly into Heathrow and you go directly out to the small, sleepy town of Bath compared to London. Meet your guide there, meet your bus there, and then you head north to the Cotswold villages, up into the northern part of Wales with its famous castles, up into the Lakes District of Cumbria, where we make Keswick our hometown, hike on Hadrian's Wall, a reminder that the Romans were there 2,000 years ago. We go to York and we finish off with a grand finale in London. If you want to complement that with South England, this is what we'll look at after that. And this is 13 days in the South, starting in London, heading over to Canterbury, all along the South Coast to Land's End in Cornwall, and finishing in beautiful Bath. Uh, so right now, we're going to remind you that we have the one-week tour of London, and then we'll get into the countryside. And I also want to stress, if you're dreaming of traveling independently, that's great. The guides are so you can get the information and do the tour without us. And of course, these guides come with the tour, so you have that information as you're tooling around, whatever you decide to travel with us, you have the guidebook, you have the guide, you have the bus and the hotels and all of the sightseeing lined up so you can get the most out of it. Right now, I would like to welcome our guest, our guest guide, Jeannie Carmichael. And Jeannie, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Oh, okay, even though it's two in the morning. Thank two. you for inviting me and thank you for joining in, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And if you wake up at two in the morning, you probably want something to drink. And I bet you're, what are you drinking, Jeannie? <laughs> oh, a nice cup of tea, of course. A nice cup of tea. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm not at 2 a.m. yet, so I'm going to drink a stout. Now, this is Guinness. This is an Irish beer, right? But you find it a lot in, in England. But oh, I'm, yeah. just, I'm just thinking of it as a stout because England loves its beers. And that's mm. a traditional ale, isn't it? Yes. Yes. It's full of vitamin B. It's, it's very good for you, Rick. It's good for the nerves. They call it a, a meal in a bottle, don't they? 
used never... to be prescribed for pregnant ladies, you know. Is that right? Yeah. And you never rush a stout, right? It takes a while yeah, for yeah. the head to go down and pour it up and so on. But this is a very, it's kind of a sweet and rich and roasty flavor. It's got mm. a lot of times barley. Mm. Mm. Lovely multi flavor. And, you, and you, don't, you don't drink the head, that's for sure. You wait until it settles a little bit. So I'll be thinking of England while I have my stout. And we're going to be traveling around. How long have you worked uh, as a guide um, for Rick Steves Europe, Jeannie? Uh, for nine years now. Nine years. And were you a guide before that, before you joined us? Oh, my Lord. Yes. I've been guiding for 42 years. 42 I've years. Obviously, started as a child. <laughs> that's right. I was going to say that's. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm just so thankful that we have experienced guides like you that appreciate our style of travel and that join us with our tours. And where are you right now? Where do you live? I'm in London, in the north mm -hmm. of London. Okay, great. Well, we're going to head out here and I'll go back to our photographs. And uh, when we think about your hometown, London, I'm just always impressed by the ever changing skyline. And you have uh, it's just quite a dynamic urban situation. But when you look past all the modern skyscrapers, you find remnants of the past and you see uh, the Tower Bridge leading up to the Tower of London. You have so much pageantry and, and, and so much ritual. We can go to Buckingham Palace and see the changing of the guard. And Jeannie, it's interesting to me in England that the royal family is such a, a big part of any visitor's um, experience. What does the royal family mean to, to an English person? Oh, well, obviously the loss of Her Majesty the Queen was a, was a great blow. So I think people started to perhaps rethink a little bit. Did you, did you read that the, the Queen of Denmark recently stepped down? So mm -hmm. people are starting to, to rethink things a little bit, I think. Um, but King Charles, his rating is rising all the time. He's got quite an act to follow, doesn't he? Following Queen Absolutely. Elizabeth. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yes. The late Queen is a, definitely a hard act to follow. I, I think there's a rationale for a royal family, but it is uh, harder and harder for a lot of people to see that in the modern mm. age. But it's a long yeah. and rich tradition. And when we do travel to England, we're very likely to see a lot of that pageantry brightening up our sightseeing, that's for sure. Well, here we have, of course, Big Ben in the halls of Parliament, and, and that's the answer to the royalty. There's where the democracy is in that uh, mm. hallowed building. Across the street, Westminster Abbey. And uh, these are amazing places. This place goes back to the, the 1200s. And when you step in there, we see beautiful, beautiful architecture. But more important than that, we see so much history. When we step into Westminster Abbey, we see the tombs of the, of the people who made Britain great, don't we? Absolutely. 3,600 people buried in the Abbey, you know? Everybody from Charles Dickens to Charles Darwin. It's, it's amazing. It, it really is like a pilgrimage to English history. Uh, and uh, walking in the square in front of Westminster Abbey, you find monuments to your great leaders like Churchill. One of the highlights for me of our London tour is going into the cabinet war rooms and remembering Britain uh, during the darkest days of the Battle of Britain in World War II, when uh, Churchill was down there with his, uh, his inner circle uh, and London was enduring the Blitz. Uh, there is so many dimensions of London that we cover in our tours. One thing I love about our London tour, Genius, we have a whole week there, and I understand it comes with the oyster card where you can get used to the public transportation system the tube really empowers a traveler doesn't it oh it's fantastic um i mean it runs from 5 30 in the morning till gone midnight you can get everywhere all around london so quickly it's a brilliant system and it's easy be, too it's easy to travel and you can be upstairs in the in the daylight complaining about the traffic or you can just go zip 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 underground yes. and that's mm -hmm. why they call it the under, underground and i just think that's good style and i'm so glad that we rely on public transit in our travels when you cross the thames river you get to the south bank and that's been uh, uh, fixed up to be very pedestrian friendly. I love the the uh, the beautiful walk all along the South Bank. We get to one place, uh, which is the famous Millennium Bridge. Lots building, lots of building in London for the Millennium uh, 24 years ago. And you walk over that Millennium Bridge, and straight ahead, you see a building near and dear to the people of London. What are we looking at here? Oh, that's St Paul's Cathedral, the Great Dome, the iconic Dome of St Paul's, which is not only beautiful it's such a symbol for us of world war ii and the resistance of people mm. during world war ii a heroic defense of london and, and this goes all the way back to i believe it was uh 1711 that christopher wren 
uh, in his very last years, got to see his son put that golden cross on top of that dome. Absolutely. He was 72. Amazing. He was 72 years old and he dedicated decades to building this beautiful, beautiful edifice. Look at that inside. Uh, Lots of history. We'll go to the Tower of London. And this goes back even further. This is Norman. And we know Norman is the style of architecture brought over from the continent with the Norman conquest. Uh, uh, What is the date that every school child in England learns? Oh, 1066. (laughs) (laughs) Lucky. It's easy to remember, thank goodness. 1066. And uh, when you go to the Tower of London, you see that beautiful castle and you get a very entertaining tour by the beef eaters and a chance to learn some of the bloody history as so many people were made a foot shorter at the top. Mm -hmm. And uh, a capper for the experience for me is to see the crown jewels. This is one of those Mm -hmm. gotta see sites in Britain. Something else that's really important for me when I'm traveling in Britain is the edible traditions. Uh, What are we looking at here and what will the tourist experience? Oh, that, that's that's scones. Now, you have these traditionally in an afternoon tea. You split it in two. I think you call them popovers, do you not? I, call, I don't know. Scones. Yeah. I like to say scones. You call them yeah. scones. Okay, right. There's two ways of thinking of this. Either you put the cream first and then jam on top, or jam first and then cream on top. Well, what's it the correct way? It depends if you come from Cornwall or Devon. <laughs> Is I, that... I'm a jam first, cream later girl because it's just easier. Hmm. I must slice the, the scone into little narrow slices and make many tiny wafers with the butter and the and the jam on it. I just love to Butter spend the too. Experience. You know how to live. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, so there's lots to do in London and it's going to be uh, worth the focus. And then our Best of England tour starts in Bath. And I just love Bath. You know, 2,000 years ago, um, big shots from the Roman city of Londinium went to a place called Aquasulis to take a bath in the mineral springs. And uh, uh, this was a spa town even back in ancient Roman times. Eventually, instead of saying, I'm going to take a bath at Aquasulis, I guess they just decided to call it bath. And we can actually see the Roman baths. It's uh, 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 easy to forget that the history here goes back to ancient Roman times. And there's remarkable um, artifacts from that period, including this beautiful statue of Minerva right there in the city of Bath. And what's also very charming about Bath is the Georgian architecture. We just learned what Norman architecture is all about. Well, the Georgian architecture is, that's the English word for neoclassical. And I remember it because when we Americans were fighting for our independence, we were fighting against King George. And this was the prevailing art style during that period named after the King Georgian. And you see this architecture and these beautiful planned uh, uh, communities or or, uh, row houses. And that is something we learn about uh, with our guide or with local guides when we're traveling in Bath. About a less than an hour south of Bath is Wells. And there are so many beautiful churches to see. And Wells has quite a unique arch. What's the story, Jeannie, about this arch in the Cathedral of Wells? Well, there was uh, an earthquake which caused the, the tower to start to, to tilt. Mm-hmm. So this genius architect called William Joy decided to make this amazing scissor arch to stabilize it. But I mean, not only is it amazing engineering, isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful. Talk about making lemonade out of lemons, huh? He Mm. took a a problem with their foundations and a bent in a in a in a tilt in a in a wonky church, and he Mm. fortified it with this gorgeous arch. And you step inside today, and you think, man, that's a beautiful. You don't realize it's a fix. And uh, uh, nearby is a church that was beyond repair. And that's a reminder of the uh, dissolution of the monasteries when uh, Henry VIII was uh, in a power struggle with the church. And uh, uh, that was uh, <laughs> that was quite a time as, as Henry VIII, uh, in the middle of the 1500s, decided to, what, level all the abbeys. Yeah. Well, they were very wealthy, you see. So he literally stole the lead from the roofs, mm. took all the land, took all the wealth. Can you imagine? In the Middle that's Ages, people would why will... the royal family is so rich. People willed their land to the church, thinking that would get them up to heaven better. And uh, the church consequently became the biggest landowner, and that kind of bugged the king. <laughs> and here we go to Glasgow and Barry, and we learn about that. Um, yeah. And, and then uh, York is a beautiful city. I love York for many reasons. Of course, it's got a great minster, a great church, but it's also got beautiful museums. It's got museums that take you back in time. The, the York Castle Museum lets you step into shops that are actually outfitted and, and stocked, just like they were 100 years ago. And the York, uh, the the National Railway Museum in York is is just the best of its kind. 
anywhere. On our tour, Jeannie, we uh, can start the day uh, in a good traditional fa fashion with an uh, old-fashioned English fry. A lot of people call it a heart attack on a plate. Ah, but I find my American friends are amazed that we bake beans for breakfast. But it means you're full of beans to start the day, you know. I, mean, it makes sense. I love beans for breakfast when I'm in England <laughs> and mushrooms and beautiful tomatoes. And of course, you don't want that for 20 meals in a row. So 20 mornings in a row. So you've got always a healthy option, don't you? You do. Yeah, yeah we do but, eat but, avocados but, as well. But mm -hmm. 200 years ago, this is what a shepherd would eat in the morning so he didn't have to come home till dinner time. Yeah, sets I, you up for the day. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, when you are out in the fields, you always have a pub nearby. It seems like we can drop into the pub and be part of the community. That's a big part of our travels. And these days, they have gastro pubs, which I just love. A gastro pub makes a big deal about the quality cuisine. It's no longer fish and chips and mushy peas in these fancy gastro pubs. You can eat quite well. We go to the Cotswold villages and so many times the place is very nice to see today because it was wealthy in the old days because of some kind of economy and there it was the wool of the sheep and with that they could build these beautiful houses and then the wool industry collapsed and they became, became so poor they didn't even bother to tear them down and build up bigger stuff and then rediscovered in the last century and today charming little time warps and uh, I just love almost nothing more in England than to walk from town to town and enjoy these these cozy little villages. For me, Jeannie, as a travel writer, it's a it's a it's a temptation to overuse the word quaint. I save my use of the word quaint for the Cotswolds. Hmm. Quite right. What yeah. do you like about the, what do you do in the what do you enjoy sharing as a guide in the Cotswolds? Ah, oh, that the stone is so beautiful. Everything is made with the local limestone. Mm -hmm which mm. is sort of honey colored in many mm -hmm. places. Oh, it's, it's, it's stepping back in time. It really is. But as you say, quaint can, can feel something slightly false, but these are living villages. You know, this is real. Very important. And in the countryside, not only do we have beautiful living villages, but we got lots of history and prehistory. Stone circles, Avebury, Stonehenge, twice as old as the pyramids in some cases. You've got a chance here to see a celestial calendar. These stones moved here from miles and miles away and erected in a way that you can tell the time to plant and the time to harvest and the time to party according to where the sun sets relative to those stones. And to get that information from your guide, what a beautiful experience. And one of my favorite things about the countryside, uh, Jeannie, is finding these stone circles that are not the famous ones that are just quietly uh, going through another century in the middle of uh, in the middle of pristine nature. Do you recognize sure. this one? Well, we do have 900 of them. Um, this, this is this is Castle Rig, which is on top of a hill in the Lake District. It's, it's so beautifully set. Look at the mountains all around it. It's oh, like I in a love couple it. of mountains. I love it all alone at sunset. What a, what a delight. On our tours, I'm so glad that we mix history with exercise and we get a chance to actually marvel at Hadrian's Wall, which, you know, 2000 years ago, the Romans spread as far essentially as the border of Scotland. And then I can just see what they did. They got, oh man, this is uh, pretty bleak up here. Let's call it an empire. We'll just build a wall from coast to coast and keep those Scottish people out. And today, 2000 years later, that bits of that wall survive. And it's quite popular to, to hike and visit the castles and so on along that wall. And uh, also up in the north of England, we have the Lake District, uh, the Cumbrian Lake District. And this is the place is where English people historically have gone to commune with nature. You've got these traditional uh, boats on the lakes. Uh, you've got the wonderful sheep culture, the little wonderful hikes. And uh, this is the home of the poet Wordsworth and, and some of the, the great poets from the Romantic Age. Uh, Jeannie, what, what do you enjoy sharing about the Lake District when you have a group up there? Oh, there's so much. I mean, that the scenery is just breathtaking. It's very different. This is the amazing thing about Britain. Everything changes in such a short distance. Yeah. So it's so interesting. I mean, the Vikings settled in the Lake District. So are many of the place names are Viking. And our it, whole base, just... I like to not stay in the touristy Windermere area, but we like to go farther north and make Keswick our hometown. And sure. uh, Keswick, this is the main square in Keswick, and it just feels a little, a little rough and tumble. It's a hiker's headquarters and a beautiful springboard for a nice day out. Uh, uh, you know, when we think about uh, Britain, 
we've got England, and it's surrounded by the Celtic Crescent, uh, Celtic nations, the Irish, the Welsh, the Scots, and in France, Brittany. Um, this, of course, is the symbol of Wales, and we go into the north of Wales, and the main things to look at there are remnants of English colonialism. Um, I think these are the castles of King Edward that were built uh, in the Middle Ages to assert yeah. English control over the angry indigenous Welsh people. And we can see a castle like this at Conway, and then we can actually sleep in the garrison town that was within those fortified walls. It, it's, it's wonderful to take Americans who, who think 100 years old is a long time for a building and to come to a place like this, isn't it? Mm. Yes, well, we do have 600 castles in Wales. We have more, so it shows how difficult it was to keep us down, you see. I, I'm Welsh. Oh, you're I'm Welsh. Welsh. Okay. Yes, I, I, I was I was on eggshells because I didn't know if you were one of those uh, <laughs> okay, English no. colonial Insult people. Insult the English as much as you like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. I, 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 I just think it's so interesting to think how feisty the Welsh were because they were totally outgunned. But mm. England came in there and built these, um, what do they call the circles, the ring of iron or something like that, all of these amazing state-of-the-art castles. And and yeah, still, the, the Welsh to this day are uh, speak their, their own language and they have a very proud culture, not to mention beautiful, beautiful terrain to explore, wonderful walks and wonderful gardens. Tell us about wow. this garden here, Jeannie. That's Bodnant Gardens, which is uh, any time of year you go is wonderful, but if you go in May, this wonderful laburnum arch. I mean, it is like drowning in gold. It is the most beautiful. You know, I'm not even that into formal gardens, but when I'm in, in Britain, whether it's, uh, or, or Ireland, um, there are so many beautiful, jaw-droppingly beautiful gardens to visit and uh, really well worth anybody's time if they're tooling around and that would be a good stop on our tour. Uh, if you would like to um, complement that tour of the best of England, we really like the south of England. And um, here we, is how we would cover that in 13 days. Uh, you can see the numbers are how many nights you'd stop in each stop there. And it starts in uh, Canterbury and the uh, White Cliffs of Dover. And then it goes all along the south coast to Cornwall and Land's End and finishes in Bath. When we look at this, a lot of people think the White Cliffs of Dover, but they don't know that all of South England is sitting on chalk like that. And these are the white cliffs of anywhere in southern England. And if you look at how thin the topsoil is, and then where the chalk hits, you can understand um, the frustrations or the challenges of farming there. And the fun, if you are a, a prehistoric um, artistic person, of cutting out the topsoil and revealing the white and uh, creating some kind of a design that people can see from a distance. But this is South Downs, this is Beachy Head, and this is directly uh, in the south of England. And it is a beautiful place to explore. And that's why I'm glad we spend a night there. And then we go to Portsmouth. Now, if you're a British person, you know, um, you know, Britannia ruled the waves, right? Uh, what is the historic and maritime significance of the city of Portsmouth on the south coast of England? Oh, well, we have such historic ships there. That's Lord Nelson's victory, mm. where we showed the French what for, of course, at the Battle of Trafalgar. But you also see the Mary Rose, the great Tudor ship. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, it is it is our greatest port. I learned so much when I got to go to Portsmouth uh, and <laughs> and to see the HMS Victory uh, and to think of the hero, hero heroism of of uh, those uh, um, uh, sailors when they were fighting that uh, epic war with France. You know, Dartmoor is one of many moors in England. I love a moor. They're they're sparsely populated. They're mystical. They just feel medieval to me. It was a medieval common ground where people could could let their 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 cattle run. And when you wander through a moor like we do here, um, you find these um, sort of lonely little scrappy bits of medieval and ancient history, don't you? Oh, and fantastic remnants of of the past as well. You know, stone yeah. circles on Dartmoor. Can you hear the Hound of the Baskervilles howling in the background there? No, but I can hear Roy Nichols right there saying it's time to get back on the bus. Oh, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Roy is one of our most uh, senior guides. I mean, I used to do Roy tours with Roy back in our minibus days. Uh, I just love wandering through the moors and finding these kind of places again, like your own the private process. Stonehenge. Yeah, this is this sure. is where I became a travel writer right here. I believe this is uh, uh, near Gidley, right in in Dartmoor. Mm -hmm. 
oh, wow, to be all alone there. And you can hike to these things and you find these wild ponies. It's just an amazing place. Hey, go further south and you might find yourself in Poldark country. I'm a big fan of Poldark. Uh, I should be so lucky. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at that. We were filming here, Jeannie, and it was so great. This is one of the most uh, wind blown, beautiful places I've ever been. Mm. Cornwall. So Wild good. country, isn't it? But it is just mm. gorgeous. And this is miners country. And uh, traditionally, the miners would go off to work with uh, not with a lunch pail, but with a pasty. Tell us about what you got there, Jeannie. There's one I made earlier. Now, this is the original takeout food. Tell us See, about it's, that. It's looks made for the miners because what it is, it's a circle of pastry and you fill it with meat and different vegetables, crimp it along the side, then you can put it in your pocket, you see, and take it down the mine to eat. And you make the crimping like this because they were tin miners, so you're, on your fingers it would be poisonous, you see, so you hold this bit and then you can eat these bits quite safely. Nice. We have them in Wales as well, we call them oggies. And in uh, Wales, we would do half meat and vegetables and half something sweet. You know, I and like that. That is a very fun, that's a fun mm -hmm. uh, uh, little meal to go. You can pick up at a bakery. Oh, absolutely. It's a meal in one. Ah, that's great. Or if you're on a Rick Steves tour, uh, you can actually go to a bakery as a group and uh, make one yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of fun. I just love these kind of experiences that our guides are finding for our groups to enjoy. And this is one of our groups making a pasty. It rhymes with nasty and it tastes really good. All right, so uh, we've got some beautiful scenery in Cornwall. This is Mount St. Michael, St. Michael's Mount. And then mm -hmm. along the Northern coast, you come to a place called Tintagel. And I find it very evocative because this is the legendary home of King Arthur. <laughs> and also, it's the place where I found my first back door. I just love this door. I, I put it on the cover of my very first book when I was 25 years old. That is oh. the door at the castle in Tintagel. Is it Lancelot and Guinevere? <laughs> <laughs> that could be Lancelot and Guinevere, couldn't it? Yeah. No, that, that's just two tourists. Okay, so that's what we've got in England that we just covered with Jeannie there. And we've got the southern coast also. Uh, we're going to head north to Scotland now. And uh, I just, I just love Scotland. I, I took our Scotland tour and I was uh, working on the Scotland guidebook and I thought I would get scripts for two TV shows. And you know, Jeannie, I got scripts for three TV shows. I want to remind people if they're, if they wonder what would we do in these countries, they can go to our website and uh, look at the TV shows on those countries, because here we have with three shows an hour and a half covering Scotland. And it's essentially what we do on our 13 day tour. Here you go. You start in Glasgow and then you head up north to Oban, the gateway to the islands. You go out to Iona, such a wonderful, a spiritual kind of place. Then we go up through the mysterious Weeping Glen, Glencoe to the town in the north, Inverness, past Loch Ness and head on back down to Edinburgh. What a beautiful look at Scotland if you got 13 days. If you only have eight days, uh, you can't do so much, but you can do a lot. We start in Inverness and sightsee our way down to Edinburgh. Edinburgh is an amazing city. It's got so much history. You've got the castle on the hilltop and going down from the castle, we've got what's called the Royal Mile. And in the Middle Ages, this was considered the first skyscrapers in Europe. And this is the most densely populated urban zone, I understand, in Europe. And it goes a mile gradually downhill from the castle down to the palace at the bottom of that mile. And that was the medieval town. And that is packed with fun sightseeing, uh, uh, great shops, wonderful restaurants and pubs. Uh, and beautiful architecture there and on the side roads. Uh, along that walk, we've got St. Giles Cathedral. And uh, this is a very important place uh, when it came to the uh, Reformation 500 years ago. Uh, the great reformer, this is not the great, this, this is Rick, the, the, the travel writer, uh, playing like he's the great reformer, but John Knox <laughs> was a big deal, wasn't he? Oh, and you yes. can, you can go to John Knox's house across the street from that cathedral and, and uh, put on a robe and grab a, a, a feather pen. Hey, Jeannie, in Scotland, uh, uh, tomorrow for us today, where you are, um, it's a big day, isn't it? What's happening oh, in Scotland? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it's Burns Night. It's, it's the celebration of his birthday, you see. 
January 25th. And absolutely, Robbie Burns is near and dear to the heart and soul of the Scottish people. What is it about Robbie Burns? Oh, he's so important because he went around talking to the old people, collecting folk tales, mm -hmm. stories of the past, and putting them into his poems and his songs. Uh, so he is the voice of the nation. He's important to me because I am named after his long-suffering wife. He was a very naughty boy. My sister is named after one of his many girlfriends. <laughs> oh, your parents had kind of a sense of humor there, I yeah. think. Uh -huh. Well, they're, they're having a lot of fun in Scotland today. Uh, they're oh, going to yeah. be uh, drinking to Robbie Burns and uh, getting out the haggis. And uh, uh, he's important historically because he uh, celebrated the romantic image of the Scottish people uh, after they were so long downtrodden by England. And uh, he actually charmed the royal family and the royal family became fans of traditional Scotland. Uh, consequently, they have their getaway up at Balmoral Castle. But when mm. you're in Scotland, you've got lots of bagpipes, you've got lots of kilts, you've got lots of, of uh, traditional outfits, and you've got a lot of folk music. Edinburgh is a great cultural center because um, of the Edinburgh uh, Folk Festival and Music Festival. Also, Edinburgh has lots going on politically lately. This is the parliament. And in the late 1990s, they had a referendum and, the, and England gave the Scottish people um, uh, limited uh, autonomy and they were able to build their own parliament building. I believe it was 2004, this amazing parliament building opened. And for the first time in centuries, the, the Scottish people had a parliament in Scotland, not in London. And you can yeah. proudly tour that today. It's a beautiful and inspiring, inspiring place to visit, isn't it, Jean? Oh, gosh, yes. It's as if it's grown out of the landscape. That's the point of the design of it. It's yeah, to make you think of Scotland. It really Correct. is. And, and you wouldn't know about all the fine, meaningful points in the architecture unless you went there and had a guide to take mm -hmm. you around and, and explain to you the importance of it. Uh, you're a Welsh person. Uh, you've got Celtic brothers and sisters in Scotland. It must be an interesting uh, relationship you've got with, uh, with uh, the, the, uh, oh. the English, you know? Well, my father's from Glasgow. That's my tartan. Okay. Yep. So I'm a real Celt. So you are a Celt. I, I just think uh, it's so fun to be celebrating the ethnic diversity and the changes as you travel within that um, beautiful island. Here's something that you find all over Europe these days, three flags in front of the city hall. You got the European flag, uh, and this might not be flying there right now because of Brexit, but it could be flying there again when Scotland decides, hey, we, uh, we oh, were yeah. sold, uh, uh, this, uh, we were, we were, we were confused at the last election because we assumed we were going to stay with the Euro European Union. But here you have the European flag, you got the Union Jack for Great Britain, and you got the Scottish flag. And it reminds us that people have conflicting loyalties all over Europe, and it's not always that easy to sort out, is it? Well, the Scots voted to remain, don't forget. Yeah, they they mm -hmm. voted to remain with the, with the European Union. Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so had... Um, it's a very interesting thing. We don't know how history is going to pan out, but I do think Brexit opens the door to a reasonable case for the Scottish people to say, we want a redo on the vote because we didn't vote to stay with England outside of the European Union. We voted to stay with Britain inside the European Union. So yeah. uh, they've mm -hmm. had to go with Brexit whether they, and they didn't really want it. This is that main drag in Glasgow. And I'm so glad we go to Glasgow. Glasgow is the industrial alternative to Edinburgh. And Glasgow is a working class town. Edinburgh is a higher educated, higher economy town where the government is. I, I think I love the phrase. Have you ever heard this, Jeannie? They say a funeral in Glasgow is more fun than a wedding in Edinburgh. My father used to say that uh, Edinburgh is like a lady who wears fur coat, a fur coat and no underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a lot of fun uh, rivalry between those two cities, and uh -huh. I think it's a shame not to go to Glasgow, and we do go to Glasgow. This is one of our guides, Cullen Mares, and he's oh, a yeah. Glasgow boy, and we have a local guide like Cullen to take us around the city and explain the street art and so on. A uh, very important castle halfway between Glasgow and Edinburgh, Stirling Castle, worth checking out. For me, a highlight was to get to know a bagpiper, and he let me play his, uh, or at least finger, his uh, bagpipe as he pumped it. And uh, we'll all get a chance to hear a bagpipe and maybe even play one. When you travel in Scotland, you are struck by the evocative ruined castles. This castle's so beautiful. And what I learned, uh, Jeannie, is that each of these castles, or many of these castles, are the 
historic capital of proud clans, right? So you have oh, yes. one castle, which would be the, the, the historic home of the Campbell clan. And yeah. people would travel from all over the world who are of Scottish heritage, and they would go to this clan, and that's where they'd have the historic artifacts, and that's where they'd have the memories of, of, of the stirring story of their people, their clan. Tell us a little bit about how what you find and learn about the clans when you go to one of these castles. Well, a clan is a family, in essence. So many Scottish names are Mac something, aren't they? McGregor, MacDonald. It means son of, you see? So okay. that's the important thing. Yeah. And you feel an allegiance primarily to your clan, to your family. This was, mm. if you like, a problem in Scotland because they could never get together to, to fight the English because they were too busy arguing amongst each other. They were more loyal to their individual clans. Well, it's a great opportunity to learn more about that. In the north of Scotland, there's a city called Ed, uh, Inverness, and Inverness is just a fun workaday town. If there's a live music going on or any dancing in a pub, your guide will know about it, and they'll be sure that you know about it. Just outside of Inverness is the battlefield of Culloden. And Culloden, uh, in, back in 1746, it was the last battle on British soil. And it was, the, it was the battle that really was the end of the clan system in so many ways up in Scotland. Uh, we have Bonnie Prince Charlie with his romantic crusade to get Scotland some independence from England, horribly outgunned by the English. And in, in just a, a few minutes, uh, more than a thousand uh, Scottish soldiers were killed and uh, they just ran for their lives. And after that, uh, it was a brutal kind of put down of Scottish spirit. You couldn't wear the, the kilt, you couldn't play the bagpipe, and you couldn't speak the language. It was a tough time for the Scottish people. And you learn about that when you go to that battlefield, Culloden. I love dropping in on our tours as I find them when I'm doing my work out and about. And I love the, the joy on the bus and the fun that people are having and uh, how much people are appreciating their driver and their guide. Uh, a great thing on our Scottish tour, I got, I, I take my tours nowadays instead of lead them. I just love signing up for our tours. And uh, I love the day that they put together a Scottish uh, uh, sampler, all the traditional Scottish uh, nibbles and drinks uh, right there. And we learned a lot. Uh, also, we were very keen on getting a musician to entertain us when we eat and also to understand the whiskey. Um, I, I just love when I'm in, I don't drink whiskey much in the United States, but when I'm in Scotland, I do. What do you got there, Jeannie? What are you showing me? Got some odd bag. <laughs> what is that? Good stuff. That's uh, from the island of Isla. That is uh, very, very nice whiskey. Show it to me again. What is that? Sure. Well, come to my house. You can have some. <laughs> All right. I've got a little bit of whiskey here. It is spelled uh, W-I-S-K-E-Y. What does that mean? <gasps> that how means is, it's Irish. <laughs> how, how, how is yours spelled? Oh, it's no E. Can you show whiskey me? Whiskey with a Y. Let's, I'm curious about this. Okay, so you've got the Scottish one. Yeah. And it's, hey, there it goes, W-I-S-K-Y. Yeah. <laughs> you have a, and, and uh, but it's, uh, they're both good whiskeys, but as a Scottish oh, yeah. person, well, first of all, I'm going to put a little whiskey into my, we're going to talk about this when we go to Ireland, well, but I'm just a little bit thirsty. Yeah, sure. We're talking about whiskey. You can have whiskey neat, right? Uh, you can have it oh, with yes. water or you can have it with ice. Only a barbarian has it with ice. Only as, but just I went a to. A few little drops of water. That's, that's what I allow. love. I went to Caddenheads yeah. at the bottom of the Royal Mile in Edinburgh wonderful little spot for your um, buying whiskey right out of the cask mm -hmm. and he told me if you just drop a little bit of water yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. into your into your whiskey it opens yeah it opens it up like like rain in a garden it opens up the flowers and the fragrance and that's mm -hmm. what i found makes a big difference slancha mm -hmm. slancha gaelic for here's to your health Mm -hmm. Toast. Oh, oh, that is really good. It's Irish. Sorry. <laughs> Scots, Scotch whiskey or Irish, but that's the guy. I buy a, a flask at his place every time I'm there. And uh, I, I, I don't let a day go by without having a, a wee nip uh, when I get into the hotel. Uh, but we'll visit a, a whiskey distillery in uh, Speyside, where most of the great uh, uh, 
uh, distilleries are. And you can just drop into a pub anytime you like and enjoy that. And I'm a sucker for the trad music, the traditional music. And you'll find it in Scotland almost with the same vigor that you find it in Ireland. I love when I'm traveling around Scotland to stumble into a clan gathering. And we don't schedule our tours around a clan gathering, but if there is one, uh, your guide will know about it and we'll probably stop and enjoy a couple of hours there. That's what we did with our Scotland tour. And I, I just had a wonderful time, almost uh, breaking my back with this uh, heavy stone event. Uh, I carried it a couple inches, but the winner could just pick it up and run around the block with it. <laughs> Beautiful dancing. Oh, so much fun. Look at the concentration on that little girl. Oh, what a thrill to not go to the big famous one that's televised, but find the small town clan <laughs> festival. Another highlight for our tours, whether they're in Ireland or Scotland or Wales, is to go to a, a, a farm and enjoy a sheepdog demonstration. This mm -hmm. photograph here is amazing to me. Look at those humiliated four sheep being terrorized by that one dog. And uh, we get to gather and get to know the dogs, get to know the farmer, get to know the tradition, and get to have a little fun with the puppies. Mm -hmm. That's one of the highlights of our tours. Feed the pup, feed, <laughs> feed the, the sheep and so on. Uh, we'll go along um, uh, Loch Ness and look for the Loch Ness monster, of course. Uh, if you look carefully, sometimes you can not see him. Uh, but this is the famous ruined castle there, or court. And when you look at the map, there's a cut right across Scotland. And that was um, quite cleverly uh, opened up for shipping back in the industrial age. And today, those locks are kind of like parks and uh, the beautiful little towns that used to be there because of the trade. And now they're just there because people are on vacation wonderful wonderful nature i think it's so important for our guides to stop the bus and let everybody just get out and and feel the wind just walk for a few hundred yards in the middle of nowhere this is one of our scottish guides liz lister and we can get a chance to get up and close and personal with a hairy coup uh and then from oban we head out to the isles uh, oban's a great town catch the ferry get out go over mole and then catch another ferry and get to the enchanting island of iona and this is one of those places that's called a thin place. The atmosphere is thin. It just, there's something spiritual about it. You're, you're close to heaven or, or something when you're in an island like Iona. And you just can imagine why the monks a thousand years ago chose to build an abbey here. And that's where they started to write the Book of Kells. And uh, when they were uh, terrorized by the Vikings, they retreated back to Ireland and took the Book of Kells with them. Great seafood, so much to enjoy. <laughs> In Ireland, even the haggis. I love the haggis. They're, drink, they're eating it today like it's going out of style on Burns oh, Night, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, I want to remind people, we've had to go pretty fast. I want to be sure I have half of the evening for Ireland. Um, and a year ago, we did our festival, just like we're doing uh, this year in one week. But last January, 12 months ago, we spent 20 evenings like this. And all of those evenings are... Um, recorded and archived, and you can find them on our website. If you go to our website and you go into the tour program, you just look up the tour. If you look up Scotland, you will then have a link where you can watch a one hour uh, event like this on Scotland. Uh, if you want to go to England, uh, and this is with uh, with Jeannie Carmichael and Lisa Friend, uh, a year ago, Jeannie was with Lisa and spent a whole hour um, uh, on England. And if you want to have a whole hour, hour in Ireland, you can have that and it's filled with important information if you're curious about any of these destinations literally triple the information is archived from last year's public uh our last year's um party uh also as i mentioned we have more than 100 episodes of tv shows that give you lots of information on sightseeing in these areas i want to take just a minute to uh review what's included in the tours uh, all of the group sightseeing we have small groups of 24 to 28 people uh, I love to have a small group of like 25 people on a 50 seat bus. It's essentially two seats per person. And with a small group, we can get into places, uh, cute little pubs, restaurants and, and hotels that you wouldn't be able to get into with a standard big, big group. You get a wonderful Rick Steves guide, like we're talking with Jeannie tonight. And you also get a lot of local guides along the way. Uh, and we have accommodations that are characteristic and centrally located. They'll never win any awards for being fancy. We're not looking for that. We want characteristic, friendly, traditional, beautifully located 
hotels. It works great for us. Uh, all the breakfasts, uh, half the dinners, all the tips are included. It's just a great program. If you want more information about that, you can find that on our website. I do want to remind you, uh, next Monday, we're having a party right here, and we're giving away two free tours. And anybody that wants to sign up gets their name in the digital bucket. Tomorrow, you'll get an email from our Monday Night Travel staff, and it will give you links to all of the things we're talking about. And that includes the um, uh, link, how you put your name in to the um, possibility to win a free tour. And also you'll get the promo code reminding you that if you use that code, you can save $100 if you sign up on a tour between now and February 5th. All of that comes to you in about 24 hours. Um, so you don't need to worry about how do I get the discount or how do I enter into the free tour contest. Uh, one thing you can do right now, if you like, is to order one of our Keep On Traveling t-shirts. Just to add to our travel fun, I asked my staff to put these shirts on half price. And we just love to have our Keep On Traveling t-shirts and they are available in all different sizes. If you like, you go to our website and you will see that deal. Hey, I would like uh, right now, before we go to Ireland, to thank Jeannie Carmichael. Jeannie, you're fantastic. Thank you for getting up uh, uh, in the middle of your night to enjoy, uh, or I hope My enjoy, pleasure. and uh, hang around for a half hour or so. Can you do that and join in the Q&A? Certainly session? will. Certainly yeah. will. See you okay. later, folks. Jeannie, thank you so much. Now, I'm going um, to introduce our Irish guide in a moment, but right now, I just want to kind of kick off Ireland and remind you that uh, when we go to Ireland, uh, Americans have the shortest vacation in the rich world. So oh, I wish everybody could take a 14 day tour of Ireland, but not everybody has that much time. Uh, and there is a seven day version if you like. But when you look at this 14 day trip, starting in Dublin, finishing in Belfast, it really does the most amazing two weeks in that wonderful Emerald Isle. Uh, if you can't have enough time to do that, the most popular parts of Ireland, I would say, are Dublin, the main city and capital, and then Dingle on the west coast. That's our favorite example of uh, small town um, Gale Tech, where it's a national park for the traditional culture. Uh, those are the two itineraries that we have. And um, when we think about Ireland, we, we really recognize that there are a lot of Americans uh, and there's a lot of interest in Ireland, and that's something that we notice in our tours. So many of our travelers have Irish heritage, uh, and uh, so many of our other travelers seem to get Irish heritage after they have traveled there. Hey, right now, I'd love to introduce to you one of our guides from Ireland, and uh, Lolly Spence is uh, up at about two o'clock in the morning from Ireland. Lolly, thanks for being with us. Good morning, Rick. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm good. It's a quarter to three in the morning here. Quarter to three. Well, you look bright eyed and bushy tailed. <laughs> What's your secret? Um, probably something similar to yourself. Slancha. 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 I'm on the Irish whiskey as well with the E in it. This is a great one now, the Dunvilles. This Dunville. is one you'll have to try the next time you're here. Yeah. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm drinking my stout with a little uh, uh, whiskey here. And, um, this is uh, Irish whiskey. I was drinking it in Scotland. So uh, was that, uh, are you okay with that? <laughs> oh, that's, that's the only, only, the only whiskey to drink. It the really Irish is whiskey. good. It really, and it really is good in Irish cut glass, isn't it? This crystal. Yeah, again, snap, snap. This will oh, be yeah. Sean's crystal yeah. from Dingle. I bet we got this from the same guy. We're going to meet him in a few minutes. Hey, um, Lolly, thank you so much for uh, staying awake or, or waking up to join us. And let's go to Ireland right now with our travelers. Um, we've got, um, when we look at this, it's a reminder that there are 30 or 40 million people of Irish heritage around the world, and most of them are in the United States. And for a lot of them, going back to Ireland is like, uh, uh, it's a part of, of, of understanding your, your heritage. It's a beautiful thing. And I have taken our Ireland tour absolutely had a marvelous time. Most of these photographs are from when I signed up on the tour. I sign up on tours uh, every chance I get with a pseudonym. So nobody knows I'm going to be on the tour until the opening uh, meeting. And then uh, uh, everybody's kind of, uh, wow, wow, Rick's here. And we just, uh, after a, a few minutes, I'm just part of the gang. And I just have so much fun uh, enjoying the people and the guides and the itineraries. Uh, when I went, my guide was Declan. Uh, do you know Declan? Molly? Oh, very well. Know him very well. He's a good friend. 
He's a good guy. And I just am so thankful for our gang of Irish guides. It's so beautiful to let I, Irish are so proud of uh, and understandably so of your culture. This shot, Lolly, reminds me of the importance of recognizing that the Emerald Island is emerald because it rains a lot. <laughs> and it looks like this group is ready for the weather, doesn't it? Well, we say we've got seven types of rain. We have Sunday rain, Monday rain, Tuesday rain. <laughs> so you definitely need, you I, need to I've, pack the water preps. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Seven types of rain every day of the week. And uh, also, I, I like to say um, um, there's no um, bad weather. Just uh, what, what, do I, what, do I, what do I say? There's no, um, there's no bad weather, just just the wrong clothing or something like that. Um, and uh, and then you mentioned that we're born with waterproof skin, right, or something. Yeah, that's it. Waterproof uh, skin. So we can get out there and have a good time. And the, you know, one minute it's raining and the next minute it's sunny. You just have seven different kinds of weather every day. And a good guide has the Irish cream handy when everybody wants a little uh, something to warm up. As we go around island, we just find out it is such a beautiful. It's a small island with a small population and uh, small roads and a lot of just drop dead beautiful experiences unforgettable experiences you don't get places in a hurry you don't want to rush ireland uh there's all sorts of fun things to slow down the traffic and uh i find ireland has the gift of gab and it's a real blessing and when i look at this shot i'm thinking of how gift of gab translates into wonderful guides uh tell us who we have here in kinsale on the south coast of ireland this is Kinsale in County Cork. We've got Dawn and Barry. Um, Dawn and Barry have been guiding for Rick Steves for years. Dawn has just retired a number of years ago, but Barry's still doing it. So yeah, he's, I, got, he's actually I, written a couple of books recently. I love his books and I love my memories of Dawn. I, I think I've worked with Dawn for 25 years at least. And uh, uh, what a dear soul. And I'm so glad he's doing well. And I'm also really thankful that much as I miss Don as he retires uh, from, you know, doing his work, there's always another generation and, and Barry is the next Don. And it's just a wonderful thing to have these friends in these towns that love sharing. Every night, wherever we go, there's very likely to be some live traditional folk music. Your guide will know where it is and they're sipping their Guinness, just like I'm sipping my Guinness. But the difference is they're in an Irish pub and Guinness does not travel that well to the United States, but it sure does well in Ireland. If you've never really enjoyed and appreciated Guinness, try it in an Irish pub. And Ireland really has had a, a, a renaissance in, in cuisine, I think. Wonderful, wonderful uh, seafood, wonderful fusion food. Um, uh, and we experience that when we eat in the gastro pubs of Ireland and, and so on. And one thing I love about our tour, Lolly, are the experiences that we that our guides all design into the itinerary. Tell us what's going on here, please. Well, here we are in the grounds of a beautiful five star hotel, Ashford Castle, and we are at the School of Falconry. And here we're having a go at flying a Harris Hawk. And very often people tell me this is a, a real wow moment, a once in a lifetime experience when these beautiful birds of prey sweep down and land in their gloved hand. You can see one coming into land here. It's just it's beautiful. And they're, they're know, light as a feather. I have always heard about falconry and I got to do it here. And it was, it like you just said, it was a highlight of that trip. Dublin is an amazing, amazing city. It was the number two city in the British Empire for generations. And uh, I say in the British Empire, because of course, Ireland was uh, a colony of England and uh, Dublin was its capital and it was a base of British imperialism. Uh, it's got a lot of beautiful Georgian buildings. It's got a lot of heritage. This is the famous Halfpenny Bridge. And there's a song on every corner. I mean, Molly Malone, you name it. Everywhere you go, people are singing songs about what they're looking at. Go to the museums and you got wonderful medieval aluminum manuscripts, including the amazing Book of Kells and treasure troves of gold that go back to ancient times in Ireland. It's amazing how much rich culture there is on what in the when, when the rest of Europe was in the Dark Ages, in the early Middle Ages. This was the Isle of Saints and Scholars. When Europe was rutting in the mud, Ireland was the place that kept the literate candle alive in Europe uh, and got it through those dark, what we call the dark ages. Uh, today, uh, there's a lot of tourism in Dublin. Uh, this is a sloppy district called um, the uh, Temple Bar. And it's a lot of fun at night uh, uh, when you're out and about. Uh, when we leave Dublin uh, for a lot of tours, the first stop might be the Rock of Cashel. Here we get a look at what looks just like a, a medieval wonderland. But 
Tell us, when we look at that, Lolly, you see a, a fortified wall, you see a church, you see a tower. What are we looking at? There's a cathedral up there. It's a really important ecclesiastical site. In this near corner of it, you can see a tall tower sticking up, almost like a finger. And these are very iconic on the Irish landscape. They're belfries, they're status symbols, they're places of security. Just to the left of that almost truncated where lightning hit it was a fabulous um, Celtic cross. Because in the days before PowerPoint presentations, the clerics would explain, you know, with illustrations carved in granite or carved in limestone and these wonderful Celtic crosses. Oh, I just love the Celtic crosses that we find in the countryside. And the reminder that a thousand years ago, this was a thriving thriving monastic community. Uh, Kinsale is uh, the, the self-described gastronomic capital of Ireland. I didn't like it when they call themselves the gastronomic capital of Ireland, but after I go there and research for my guidebook, I agree. The best restaurants are really in Kinsale. There's Don with one of our groups, and uh, we're getting a historic walk through the town, and uh, you got Charles Fort. And Charles Fort is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a state-of-the-art fort, that takes us back to the 1600s. Well, the most uh, tragic date in Irish history is what, 1601? Yeah, 1601 in the Battle of Conceal, that's right. You know, when the Gaelic chieftains surrendered ultimately to the British crown. This fortress was built after that. This is Charles Fort and then James Fort is across the way. This came later in the 17th century. But in its star shape there, you see the star shaped fort. It would yep. remind you of the star shaped forts of America. Most recently, of course, the Pentagon. Ah, that's a modern day star shaped fort. That's yeah. right. And and this was a state of the art fort, the star shaped so you can uh, defend yourself against attackers that might find refuge near the wall. But you're within a uh, bow and arrow uh, shot of anybody that is attacking your building there. And to take a tour of that fort and to understand its 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 importance, because when the English put down the uh, Irish um, uh, earls there, uh, they just ran for ran for their lives, and that was the end, uh, really, of uh, organized resistance against British colonialism. Uh, we uh, drive through some beautiful countryside. My favorite part of the uh, west coast of Ireland is Dingle Peninsula, Slayhead. It's about as close as you can get on the mainland of uh, Ireland to the United States. It's where people stand on the bluff and they look out and they say, ah, the next parish over is Boston. And when you look at those hills there, you have memories of the famine of 1848. The population of Ireland today is about half what it was before the famine. Uh, and this happens to be a Gale Tech, literally a, a Gaelic speaking district. And a Gale Tech is a national park for the traditional culture where people actually speak Gaelic first and English second. And if you look carefully, you can see the furrows. Those are the famine furrows uh, plowed 170 years ago when the famine hit, the potatoes did not uh, ripen and uh, they were just left in the ground and the people died and uh, they never planted since. Uh, it's a very powerful experience to go through Ireland with a good guide and have an understanding of the tragedy of the famine. The famine where the indigenous people who lived on potatoes had nothing to eat and the absentee landlords who owned the land continued to grow crops for export that weren't potatoes and a lot of food went from Ireland to England uh, and it made a lot of money for absentee landlords as the indigenous people of Ireland were being starved down. A third of Ireland's population either emigrated or died during the Great Famine. You'll learn more about that when you are with your guide exploring the countryside. I love making Dingle our headquarters. And when we go to Dingle, we really have a chance to enjoy that music. And we can go out to the uh, Dingle Crystal and meet a guy named Chandelay. There's Chandelay. I just think it's amazing, Lolly. Have you ever thought about how Chandelay, he's our friend that runs the Crystal Place. His name is Chandelay. His parents named him that. <laughs> That's the French word for chandelier. I mean, chandelier. And he grew up to be a well-known glass cutter. I mean, he cut the um, cut glass doors in the finest hotels in Old Dingle. They're done by chandelier. And then yeah. this glass that I'm holding here was cut in chandelier's little yeah. wine, uh, glass place. And the last couple of years, it has been Sean and his family. It's a family-run workshop who have made the cut crystal glass bowl, which is taken out to America and presented to President Biden the last two years with shamrocks in on St. Patrick's Day. So for a small little family-run business in Dingle, he's really making his mark internationally now. And he's a gentleman. He's just, he and his dog, Harley. <laughs> uh, Harley's also a big attraction when we go there. He's got a dog named Harley? 
Yes, and a Harley Davidson motorbike <laughs> sitting in the I, I don't remember the dog, but I remember a big Harley Davidson bike yeah. when I was in his place. But okay, well, here's Deshaun. I didn't know he was uh, that Slancha. distinguished. Uh, Slancha. Yeah. Slancha. There's a picture of you in the wall in there as well. I got to get back. And then Bono. <laughs> oh, me and Bono. Great. All right. Hey, well, it's a fun souvenir and um, good for Sean. And, and I, I'm just thankful the way our guides have worked so hard to connect us with wonderful local artisans. It's a big part of your travels and we love it. We take our groups to these amazing sites and we explain them. So when you step inside, you go, wow, the Gullerus Oratory 800 years ago or whatever. I don't know exactly how, how old is this? Do you know what century the Gullerus Oratory would be from? This is over a thousand years old now. It's probably the oldest Christian structure in stone still on the island of Ireland. It's beautiful. Ah. It's constructed without any mortar, but it's dry, dry inside. And you step inside. I've been in there in a driving rainstorm and it's just dry as a bone. And that mortar was more than a thousand, the, the stones without mortar, more than a thousand years old. We come to the Cliffs of Moher. This is the far west of Ireland. What an amazing hike that is. We explore the Burren, the, uh, and uh, <laughs> whoa, oh, the west coast of Ireland, uh, Lolly, is so evocative to me because I kind of have a heart for the underdogs when it comes to colonialism. Cromwell yeah. came over there, and you remember what the famous thing he said about Connemara, or that, what did they say, go to hell or go to Connemara? He says you can go to hell or go to Connacht, basically sent the, the people west of the Shannon. But we have a word, an Irish word, driocht. And it kind of means like an enchanted magic. And there's a driocht about the west of Ireland. When you're out in this moonscape or out on the Aran Islands, you're coming around the mountains of Connemara or Mayo. It is magical. It takes you to a different place. What is that word? I haven't heard that. That's a beautiful thing. Driocht. D-R-A-I-O-C-H-T. Driocht. It means like a mystical enchantment. There is a driocht. There, there, there needs to be a word for that because I've experienced not even knowing there was a word for it. I mean, when we look at this in the Burren, which is a fascinating area for uh, for flowers and so on, you can see um, this uh, uh, megalith structure, these stones, two stones with a with a what do you call it? A, um, a what's the one? Uh, a capstone. capstone. And it's important to remember that was underground. It was mm -hmm. like a tomb, wasn't it? And the the dirt has since eroded away. And the bones of that structure from, you know, a thousand years BC or whatever survive to this day, reminding that very um, mysterious civilizations were there long, long before there was any history. We go off of the mainland to the Aran Islands. It's a beautiful opportunity to get to the most remote part of Ireland. And when we land there, we're tempted to take a horse carriage, but more practically, we team up with a farmer in a minibus. And with a group of uh, 25 people, you'd probably have three minibuses, three farmers, and we get out and explore that island together. On the far end of that island, there's an Iron Age fortress called Dunangus, uh, which is a fascinating structure. Well, what do you tell your groups about Dun Angus, Lolly? Oh, they're putting their hands in ancient history here. They're understanding prehistory, really. They make their way up this hill to the, the last fortress in Galway, really. You know, it, it is, you're looking over a cliff. You know, if you've got the courage, you can crawl to the cliff edge and peer down 300 feet into the crashing Atlantic. You know, mm. if your glasses fall off your head, they're going to come right across, meet a polar bear, <laughs> land somewhere over in New York, probably. But it really is magical. And to imagine a civilization living here thousands of years ago is breathtaking. Very defensive. They were expecting attack. Those jaggy stones you see sticking mm. up the chevaux de frise, they've been placed like that so that anyone attacking couldn't run in a straight path. They would be held up by those stones. But it's an amazing place. It's a great spot. And you'll be rewarded, you know, for the one kilometre hike up if the guide maybe has a wee dram of something in a rucksack. Hey, that's nice. And I remember the thrill of, of inching out to that cliff and looking down and seeing the backs of the birds as they fly and seeing <laughs> the surf far below. And then I'm, I'm just so scared. I'm, my whole body becomes like a suction cup holding onto that rock. <laughs> wow. Uh, we got a chance to learn about the traditional Karaks uh, and uh, how until relatively recently, there were very humble communities living on that far fringe. 
I believe no trip to Ireland is complete without going to the north as well as the Republic. And uh, Belfast is an amazing city. Of course, it had a, a, a long story of the troubles and there was a lot of uh, very dark and difficult times in Belfast. But that really feels like a long time ago now. Uh, Belfast is a, a, a great uh, industrial uh, shipyard. Uh, of course, the Titanic was built in Belfast. And today, the major draw for tourists is to go to see the Titanic Museum. And it is really an amazing uh, site. It's a state of the art museum. And one thing I was very impressed by Lolly when I was in Belfast was the um, music and dance culture that you can find in a lot of the uh, pubs and the venues. It's becoming much more prevalent. We have been enjoying 25 years last year since the signing of a Good Friday Agreement and the peace dividend is really paying off. We've got so many students, international visitors, nightlife, you know, there's restaurants catering for anything and everything you might want. There's pubs, there's young people everywhere dancing and shopping and there's theater. It's, it's a city transformed. You know, when you think of the heartache in the Holy Land right now with Gaza and Israel, and you think of those sectarian challenges where everybody's dug in and they're, they're killing each other, you know, Ireland had the troubles and it had its sectarian problems, but Ireland has been a model in overcoming this. And of course, it's a complicated story, but the people of Ireland learned that it's best for both communities just to give everybody a little wiggle room <laughs> and live together. And when we go to Ireland, we celebrate that. Of course, you've got your, your, your um, uh, uh, loyalist communities and your uh, unionists where you've got your union jacks everywhere and there are people that are um, fearful and, and angry just like we have people in our society and which is so divided that have this kind of burden uh, but there's a peace wall it used to be a dividing wall now it's called the peace wall and it's filled with uh, john lennon all you need is love kind of propaganda uh, uh, um, graffiti uh, and there are now guided tours of both of the neighborhoods Protestants still live together in one working class neighborhood. Catholics still live, to live together in another uh, working class neighborhood. And uh, they are learning that, that uh, violence doesn't work. Uh, uh, tell us how we treat that with our groups, Lolly, to learn and have a experience connecting with these uh, communities and, and work to get a dual narrative to hear from voices from both communities. It's so important to give that balance, you know, um, I was a producer in the BBC for 15 years before I was a tour guide and we were always trained that you have to give balance. If you give salt, you give pepper. If you give Protestant, you give Catholic. Um, in the past, you might have got a very one-sided narrative, but nowadays there are much greater lengths being gone to to ensure that delivery is fair and balanced and you hear it from both sides. Plus the fact that the troubles are moving into the history. The young people up to the age of 25, 26 now didn't grow up with this legacy and they're much more rounded. So thankfully we do talk about the troubles as a historic event now. And while we keep one eye on the troubles of the past, we're very much more forward looking. I love the thought that it's becoming more of a history book thing than a uh, tragic, uh, my uncle just got locked up kind of thing. Um, <laughs> I, I, whenever I see a wall, I see that an unintended consequences of a wall is to keep the younger generation on both sides of that wall unable to talk to each other. And they consequently are saddled with their parents' baggage and their yeah. parents' hangups. And if the young generation can just get together, they can break free from that cycle of violence. And uh, the Irish, both uh, the, the Republic of Ireland and uh, the Ulster community, they were so creative and so determined to build peace. And they did these initiatives where the younger generation would go to a summer camp together and they'd dance together and they'd party together. <laughs> and it really works. So today we look at this, uh, uh, the, the, the hard history of both communities and we learn from, from their uh, political posters and their wall paintings and so on and their art. But we know that it's a time of hope. And uh, uh, it is something we can, uh, we can go and learn from. But this is what I love. In Derry, you've got the Peace Bridge and you've got a beautiful monument like this. And what does that tell us, Lolly? This sculpture is called Hands Across the Divide and this stands at the end of the Craig Avon Bridge in Derry. And it represents people, two communities reaching towards each other. They're almost there, their hands are about to meet. 
Now, if you were there last year, they had their COVID masks on. Sometimes they've got Santa Claus suits on or football gear. They're dressed up. Quite often they'll have a tin of beer in their hands, you know, but... <laughs> This, a picture of this sculpture was actually on the front cover of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in 1998. So it's very symbolic. Oh, I love it. I would love to be on your bus and learn more about the whole beautiful story of Ireland. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, uh, old and new and good and bad and uh, happy and sad. On the north coast of Ireland, you have a, a wonderful um, region, uh, the Antrim Coast, it's called. Uh, we use the resort of Portrush as our Portrush as our home base. We visit the famous Giant's Causeway. And what are we looking at here from a geological point of view, Lolly? Oh, from a geological point of view, we are looking at 40,000 basalt columns. It's incredible. You know, we're going right back to a time when molten lava rose up from the center of the earth, rose up through cracks in the limestone, cooled very slowly and cracked to form these beautiful columns. But geology isn't as much fun as myth and legend. We prefer to tell the story of Finn McCool, the great Irish giant who built a causeway to get across to Scotland. Sorry, Jeannie, to beat up the Scottish giant Ben and Donner over there. So it's a that's a, a better story to tell. But it's a magical place. I was there not that long ago and the northern lights were in the sky. And to sit on the giant's causeway on the Atlantic, on the very north of the Emerald Isle, with the sky all purple and green above was a really magical moment. Whoa, what a great experience that must have been. Also up there in the North Coast, just a, a half an hour drive away, you've got Dunluce, which is a castle that is halfway fallen into the sea and uh, so much more to see. And also we could talk all day about the uh, the little people and, 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 uh, and, and the leprechauns and all of that. Um, but this is this, the, the picture that I like. It's a, it's a younger generation that knows peace in Ireland today. All right. Hey, well, we've got Ireland in 14 days, starting in Dublin, heading down to Kinsale, over to the West Coast with Dingle Peninsula, uh, and then uh, up to the Aran Islands and the Cliffs of Moher, and then all the way up to the Antrim Coast in the north and finishing in Belfast. Belfast is just a quick two-hour train ride uh, from Dublin, and crossing the border is, you hardly know you've crossed the border. Uh, it's a beautiful way to look at this beautiful island, both the Republic and Northern Ireland. If you have less time, uh, we have a one-week itinerary, which just is a beautiful week uh, starting in the west at the airport near the airport of Shannon uh, we of course we want to do Dingle correctly there's plenty of stops along the way include the Rock of Cashel and Kilkenny and we finish in beautiful Dublin uh, we also talked earlier with Jeannie we talked about uh, England in two weeks and South England in 13 days we got Scotland in the long tour and Scotland in the short tour all right, so that's what we've got going on if you're interested in traveling in this area. And I want to remind you that uh, tomorrow we're going to Spain and Portugal, then it's France, then it's Germany, Austria, Switzerland, then it's Central Europe, and then we have our party right here in my house, a virtual party, and you are invited next Monday, same time, same station. Now, this is a shot that I just want you to look at because these are, these are our guides. And we've got 150 guides, just like Jeannie and just like Lolly. And each of them is passionate about their countries, and it's fun. It's so much fun uh, to have the, the privilege and the responsibility of your long-awaited, long-dreamed-for trip to Europe. And uh, we will do our very best to make that time and money very well spent. Hey, thank you, Lolly. And Gabe, I think it's a great time right now to get Jeannie back and, uh, and uh, answer some questions. We have a lot of wonderful questions for the three of you tonight, um, as well as I should say many tour members that have taken tours with Lolly and Jeannie and want to send their greetings. So Lolly and Jeannie, a lot of your former tour members are saying hello. Um, I wanna start with a quick, a few questions about some kind of travel tips. And Rick, I wanna start with you. Susan is wondering what is the best time of year to visit? Um, the British Isles. I know that you always plan your travel year very carefully mm -hmm. um, by kind of weather and destination. So what would I'm be really your recommendation? That, yeah, Gabe, I'm not good in the heat. And I am very careful to avoid Spain in the summer if I can, you know, avoid Greece in the summer if I can. And I was very proud this last year. I traveled from Morocco to Iceland and from Poland to Spain, you know, and uh, I never found my weather going out of the 70s or maybe the low 80s. And it was a beautiful time because I jiggered it correct. When it comes to Britain and Ireland, I would say, and I'd love to get Lolly and Jeannie's take on this, 
Um, I don't think you're going to have debilitating heat like you want to avoid in the south of France. And I would go for peak season because I like the long days. I want more weather. And I like there to be energy in the sites when there's lots of tourism. Having said that, I also think it's really important, whether you're going in the peak of summer or shoulder season, to pack in a way where you are not pushed into your hotel because of bad weather. You want to be out there with your parka and your wool hat, enjoying it, rain or shine, wind or not. Uh, and uh, you can travel then in the spring and fall also. Uh, but um, Jeannie, what do you advise if people have flexibility and they could go any month of the year? Personally speaking, I love the springtime. Uh -huh. Our country is beautiful in spring. It's just uh -huh. lovely. But you can never rely on the weather. You know, it's yep. different every day, which is makes it interesting. I got to say, when I'm making a TV show, I'm always stressed out in England, <laughs> Scotland, Ireland, because I cannot count on good weather and I want good weather. <laughs> Lolly, what would you advise uh, as far as um, in the summer, a lot of people want to avoid the crowds and the heat. Uh, is that an issue in Ireland, or would you would you say that's more lively than the than the shoulder time? Okay, everything's changed. When I was a wee girl, we had four seasons, and now we've just one big confusion. Last April was beautiful. July, we had the hottest month on record with temperatures away into the 30s, which is the 90s for you. Um, we had the wettest August ever recorded. So it's, it's you know, it's very arbitrary. I do think May and September are good months to come. And the other advantage of May and September is that our children are still at school. So you get to go do a lot of the, um, you know, attractions without all the school children there on their day trips. Okay, so you'd go for May or September. Very good. Next, Gabe. So, uh, Jeannie, I have a question for you. Um, Brian was wondering, within Great Britain, do you generally recommend that people get a British rail pass and travel by the rails, or do you recommend getting a car? Oh, now, some parts of, of Britain are not covered well by trains, for example, the Cotswolds. So if you were going there, you would definitely need a car. But by and large, I mean, we have a wonderful train system and you can get great deals. I mean, especially for Scotland, you can get fantastic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, train passes that you can use on the ferries to go to the islands and that kind of thing. So it would very much depend which part of the country you wanted to go to. By the way, I like to make a mix. When I go to England, I definitely do not want a car for Bath, for London, for York or Edinburgh uh, or Glasgow. And I would recommend if you want to have the car is fun because it gives you the power to tool around and explore the Isle of Skye or the northern part of Wales, just or the Cotswold villages. But I would do, I would fly into London and take the train straight to Bath, do Bath, and then pick up my car in Bath, then do all the small town stuff, turn the car in in Glasgow, and then just do a series of big cities back to London, Glasgow, Edinburgh, York, London. And then you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Because uh, it's, it's Brian, the, the trains are wonderful in, in England too. Remember, Brian, we drive on the correct side of the road in this yeah. country. Well, my follow-up question I was going to ask Lolly, um, if you, if somebody did in, I mean, in Britain or Ireland want to get a car, I know a lot of Americans have some trepidation about driving on the wrong side of the road. Um, hey. They have trepidation hey, about listen. driving on the right side of the road because they're used to driving on the wrong side. So what, <laughs> what tips do you give Americans about driving um, in Ireland, Lolly? Um, just take your time. You <laughs> Really take your time. There are a lot of tourists and a lot of higher cars driving mm -hmm. around. Everybody's going slowly and carefully. One of the comments I get most often from visitors is, thank goodness we have a coach, you know, especially coming around the sleigh head and those windy roads or you come behind an Irish traffic jam like Rick showed us where there's a flock of sheep in the middle of the road. The motorways are great, easy to drive on. But when you come down the, the side roads, the hedgerows can be meeting on either side. You know, there could be yeah. somebody in a horse or some pheasants. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's hairy <laughs> enough. You know, I've been on so many buses, either in England, Scotland or Ireland, where uh, the groups give the, the bus driver a, a, a applause when he, he or she navigates this or that little narrow passage. And I distinctly remember the frustration of being in a car when you can't see over the hedges. And when you're on your bus, you don't even care about the hedges. You got this high, wide, beautiful view, no stress at all, and just enjoying the ride until you get to your hotel. I, I, that's one of the beautiful things about uh, having being on a bus tour in Britain and Ireland. 
We also have a question from Pamela, um, and Pamela would like to know, a lot of travelers love the pubs of the British Isles, the beer, the music, the rubbing elbows with the locals. The whiskey. What are some tips that you have about pub etiquette, though? Is there anything that people should have in mind? Do they order at the bar and then sit down? Do they sit down and wait for somebody to come to them? Anything pub etiquette wise to keep in mind? You need to go to the bar to order. Okay. And um, you just chat to people. It's hard to be lonely, you know, when you've got <laughs> pubs. And just in London alone, there are three and a half thousand of them. So it's a challenge. Lolly, what's your advice for a pub etiquette or pub strategy? Um, my best advice is <laughs> when, when it comes to drinking Guinness, very often when people order a pint of Guinness over here, as soon as the bartender has poured it, they start drinking it. But you mustn't do that. You have to let your pint settle. So you sit and watch it. It takes almost a minute and a half. The black becomes blacker. The cream becomes creamier. And then <laughs> Rick's got it there. And then you drink that first drink right through the cream into the black so as you get a moustache. And that's how you <laughs> should drink your first sip of Guinness. You know, I had that experience, Lolly, because I, I, I don't know if you, uh, when I poured my Guinness, of course it had the head. And I thought, everybody's watching. I don't want to sit here for a minute and wait for it to get down. So I, I took a sip and I go, this is all wrong. You're just getting the foam. You know? <laughs> now we're ready to enjoy it. Never rush the Guinness. You know, it takes a while to pour it. And any good uh, bartender will let it calm down and, and, and fill it up. Very important. I think for me, the a pub means public house. It's where people go to talk. And the American traveler should consider themselves really interesting, really a blessing for that pub. You're not going to be noisy and just your own little click. You're going to connect with people and you've got a story to share and you're fascinating and you're confusing. And if you are uh, a little bit extroverted, you're going to have all sorts of friends. And I find if you sit at the bar, it's like saying, hey, I'm here and I want to talk. If you sit with your friend at a table, you're much less likely to get into a conversation. Um, does that does that make sense to you, Jeannie? Oh, very much so. And another thing to bear in mind, um, there's often a lot of people outside the pub because you're not allowed now to smoke oh, inside yeah. the pub, you see. So the smokers will go outside. So don't be put off by thinking, oh, look at that big crowd of people. Go inside. Oh. There might not be anybody inside. Interesting. And, and the pub grub is getting better and better and oh, better. Yeah. I, yeah. I just think it's amazing, this whole gastro pub thing in Ireland, Scotland, and England. Excuse me, Gabe. No, no, it's all right. Because I think you've kind of answered another question. Diane was asking, uh, for people that don't drink alcohol, like, would you still recommend going to a pub? And it oh, sounds gosh. like the yeah. camaraderie and there's plenty of good food to be had. So pubs are kind of a place oh, for everybody. Yeah. Coffee, tea, Jeannie, Jeannie was alcohol just free. Talking, mm -hmm. Jeannie, you were, weren't you talking about a zero Guinness? Yes, it's really good. Zero alcohol Guinness. It's delicious. No, we do big ranges of, you know, zero alcohol, wines, beers. This is the you know, big thing now. We're all I do want to wanna, I do wanna clarify that because, you know, we're always going, hey, slancha, but you don't need to have alcohol in your hand to be part of the party. Remember that. Mm -hmm. Europe is really good all over Europe at zero um, alcohol beer because there's such a very strict um, um, regulations about driving with even a little bit. There's, there's no alcohol you are allowed. So... There's a designated driver and that person is drinking soft drinks or zero beer. And as Jeannie mentioned, it's really good beer. Um, so remember, you can be part of the party, whether you drink wine or beer or not. It's just fun to be there. Embrace it. Get a Coke, get a zero beer, get some kind of a Shirley Temple and you are right there. You're legit unless you are your own enemy and pull yourself away from it. All right. Well, you you're making me want to go across the street to the Church Key Pub after this. Uh, rub rub some elbows with my fellow Edmonds people. Um, we have time for one last question, and I would like to know from each of you. Um, I mean, the British Isles are such an iconic destination for so many travelers. What would you say um, in your respective country, or Rick, you can pick either? Um, what is one site that you find to be overrated? And what is one site that you find to be underrated? Jeannie, let's start with you. People are often a bit disappointed about the changing of the guard. Mm -hmm. They'll say, 
is that all they do? I mean, I think they expect them, I don't know, to tap dance or juggle or something. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> soldiers. They march. You know, that's what they do. So people often say that. Um, ah, must see, where would I start? Um, honestly, Gabe, if we had all night, I could keep you here all night. <laughs> yeah, but no. Well, really. you've already gone pretty much all night. <laughs> <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning for our guests. Yeah. Here. Lolly, what yeah, is yeah. your Lolly? What's your vote for the most uh, underrated and most overrated and then most underrated site in Ireland? I think probably for the most overrated now, I would go for the whole Temple Bar precinct of Dublin, only because in recent years it's almost suffered from over tourism, and you're not actually going to find Irish people there anymore. It's you're just going to find a lot of visitors and overpriced beer and overpriced restaurants. It's interesting to walk around. It's very colourful. The cobbled streets are picturesque. The bar fronts are well worth taking a photograph of, but it's very overpriced, so that can be disappointing. But Connemara and Mayo out in the West, you know, if if I'm if I die and I'm cremated, part of my ashes are going out there. You know, it's just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, if you never visit a single place in Europe, go out to the west of Ireland. It's wow. perfect. Wow. Great answers, both of you. Um, I, I love that kind of a question because um, there are underrated places, and there are overrated places. I was thinking the uh, over, overrated places, I'm appalled that the two of the most visited sites in London are the Torture Dungeon and Madame Tussaud's Wax Gallery. Torture Dungeon, it has, it's just a bunch of paper mache gore. It's got no artifacts. It's just a goofy, gimmick. Madame Tussauds is so greedy, it does perfect price discrimination according to the time that you can go. And it's just, um, it's just, there's, there's other places that are, are really cultural. You know, they can be entertaining, but uh, when you go there, you're not able to go to some other place. Um, in Ireland, I think the most overrated is uh, the Blarney Stone. Even after COVID, Cameron, who was just there researching our book, reported that there's an hour long wait every day to kiss the Blarney Stone. If you knew what the boys in that town did to it last night, you would not want to kiss it. I'll tell you that. Right, Lolly? <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> and it's horrible. And all the cruise groups, they get off their cruise ship, I don't know, Cove or something, and then they make a beeline. Where do they go on a cruise ship? Of all the places in Ireland, you're so close to so much magic, they go to Blarney. Why? Because they've all heard about Blarney. Some, I don't know who told them about Blarney, but they're hell-bent on going to Blarney, and they all line up dutifully, Forgive me while I rant here for a minute, but all of these precious people on their precious trip, they line up for two hours to kiss that stupid stone. <laughs> and then they go back to their ship. So what can I do? So those are the most uh, overrated places. The most underrated places are the industrial cities. In England, you got Blackpool and you got Bristol. I just discovered Bristol half an hour past Bath. I love the industrial cities that are now edgy and creative and lively. In Scotland, everybody goes to Edinburgh. Remember, Glasgow is just 45 minutes away by train, and it has soul, it has spirit. And in Ireland, I would say Belfast is the emerging city that is the industrial city, whereas Dublin is the elegant city. So of course you see Dublin, and of course you see Edinburgh, and of course you see Bath. But go 45 minutes further and connect with those industrial age cities, those second cities. Hey, what a great conversation. Lolly Spence from Ireland and Jeannie Carmichael from London and England. You guys are great tour guides. I'm, I, I can imagine people have been commenting who have traveled with you on a Rick Steves tour in the past. Uh, they're just happy to see you. I just know the kind of experience that you share and I'm just thankful for, for, for your passion and to have you on our team. And uh, Gabe, thank you for hosting so capably. Tomorrow we're going to Spain, then we're going to Germany. We've got lots of travels coming your way. And I just want to say happy travels to everybody. Thanks for joining us and uh, keep on traveling. Good night, Jeannie. Good night. Good night, Lolly. Enjoy the rest of your whiskey. Eo, Eric. Good night. Slancha, slancha. Good night, everybody. See you tomorrow.